Welcome to Save on Plants. In this info video, we'll be discussing the proper way of planting bald and burlap plants. While this specific info video is entitled for bald and burlap plants, which is the top right corner photograph, uh, the instructions are almost identical to plastic potted plants. The big difference is that the bald and burlap plant is never ever disturbed in terms of its root ball. At root ball you must handle it like an egg. You do not try to scratch up the roots. You do not try to crack the root ball. You leave it 100% intact. The material is not to be removed and the cord is to be left on until after it's planted at which time all you do is you cut the cord at the base of the trunk and leave it there. You do not even have to remove the cord at any time. Just cut it loosen it up around the base of the trunk and peel back the material a bit. Another small difference with the bald and burlap, we recommend a smaller window for when you can plant them. And this would be late April to early May. Throughout this video you will hear us use bald and burlap or plastic pot possibly interchangeably in the videos. Uh, we did this to save time because as we mentioned uh, the instructions are basically identical for the two in terms of the planting. The big difference is how you handle the root ball. With the plastic potted uh, plants, you do remove the plastic pot. That does not go into the ground. And you do scratch up the roots. You also have a, a wider window as to when you can plant a plastic potted plant versus bald and burlap. When planting any type of bald and burlap plant, we always encourage you to plant these before May 7th. The reason for this is that the roots have not started to stretch out yet and the bald and burlap material is not treated. It, because it's not being treated it will actually decompose probably by about mid-May in, in which case the root ball will start to fall apart and start to have some problems with it. Uh, if you were to choose bald and burlap material that was treated with either copper sulfate or arsenic you run into trouble with that material does not decay and it actually contains the roots when they're trying to stretch out during the early part of the season. Uh, for that reason we only sell plants in non-treated bald and burlap and we encourage you very strongly to do all these plantings before May 7th. We will extend the selling period to May 15th if it is a cool spring and the bald and burlap material is still holding together well which does occur on, in some springs depending on the weather. Now cedars in general are best planted in late April or early May if they're bald and burlap or in early September if they are properly pot grown. And by pro properly pot grown what we uh, recommend is that they be bald and burlap in the springtime, dug in, in March like they should be, bald and burlap and then potted up right away into plastic pots, into a larger plastic pot with a soil medium to transition the roots uh, from the bald and burlap to where they're going to be ultimately on your property. In addition to that, uh, there's bone meal that is used around that root system to help uh, stimulate the roots so that when you go to plant that in September, you've got yourself a very healthy root ball. You want to avoid planting bald and burlap plants in September because either A, they were dug in the summertime, which is not a good time to be digging these trees up, or B, they were treated with uh, either arsenic or copper sulfate to extend the life of that bald and burlap material. And again, as we mentioned, by doing so, you are going to restrict the growth of those roots and we will not sell any plants in treated bald and burlap material. Now, a drainage test hole is very important. Uh, the more test holes you do, the better. And what a test hole is all about is trying to find out what kind of drainage you have on your property. And this can vary greatly, not just from uh, location in terms of town or city to city, but actually literally within someone's own backyard you can have a range of drainage depending on um, how that soil was handled when they built your home you can end up having a pocket of sand in one corner and some clay in another corner so it's really important to know the exact drainage in the exact locations where you're going to be planting so we encourage you to do a test hole at the location where you're going to be planting. Now this is not a waste of time as far as the work goes because that test hole will ultimately be the hole for your plant. So you got to dig the hole anyway. Dig the hole, fill it up with water, 
monitor how quickly it drains. We have run into situations where two holes that were dug literally five feet apart from each other had totally different soil where one would drain almost immediately and the other one would still hold the water five days later. So you want to know what kind of drainage you have. You can work with all these different types of drainage. That's not the problem. The problem is not knowing what you have with respect to drainage. So take the time. Wherever there's going to be a plant, uh, dig a hole, fill it up with water, make a note how quickly it drains. Bring that information with you and we will help you to design a custom watering schedule specifically for that type of plant and that type of soil to eliminate the guesswork because uh, as we've talked about in our other info videos the biggest reasons plants fail especially cedars is because they don't have a good root ball that's our responsibility as a grower and the garden centers to make sure you get a proper root ball and you'll get that from us now we have to make sure that they get watered properly. You put those two together and you should have 100% success and that's what we want to see. Now planting bald and burlap plants, there's no exceptions to this whatsoever. You leave the burlap material on the root ball. Do not cut the material, do not do anything with that material. As you receive it from us that is going to go into the ground as one package complete. Uh, do never purchase plants in treated burlap or twine. You'll know it's treated burlap or twine if it's an, uh, either a bluish or a greenish color. Untreated burlap and twine will be a natural tan color, sort of like sand. Treated burlap is good for the garden centers but bad for the customer. It extends the shelf life of the material but is usually either copper sulfate or even arsenic, which is toxic. Uh, it slows down the material from breaking down and thereby prevents the roots from spreading out. You don't want that. You want those roots to start to uh, establish themselves and get settled in. And they're not going to do that if they're being held back by the treated burlap material. Now you only cut the twine around the burlap after it's planted. That is, it's in the ground and the root ball itself is covered with soil. The twine that wraps the burlap tight against the trunk of the tree at the base of the trunk that is where you cut it and you can peel that back a bit yeah, away from the trunk. But you don't do this until it's in the ground and covered with soil and you know you're not going to be moving it around anymore. You do not remove the burlap at any time. Make sure you watch this complete video before you actually start your planting. Handle the root balls with care. Do not drop or try to break them up in any way. Uh, we've seen this where customers think that they are benefiting the root by trying to break that root ball. It, you've guaranteed death to the root ball. Uh, plants that are grown in plastic pots, yes, those you would uh, scratch up the roots. But if it's bald and burlap, you do not disturb the root system. In fact, you should be treating that root ball just like it's an egg. And we've come up with some new systems to reduce the vibration on the plants as they're being moved around from the farms to us as well as from us to you and uh, this has dramatically improved any possible chance of damage to the root ball. Once it's in your uh, responsibility, in your possession, uh, you've got to do your part to make sure that you don't uh, drop these root balls or be careless with them or drag them around. You lift them and treat them just like they're an egg and you won't have any problems with them. You also have to protect the root ball from dehydrating. Because they're bald and burlap as they are, uh, they will dehydrate quickly. So being moist alone is not enough. Again, we've come up with some techniques uh, to ensure that they're kept hydrated while they're here. And we have some systems that uh, will help you or advice that will help you once they get onto your property, how to maintain them until they're ready to be planted. And uh, it's very important that uh, you follow these instructions. Uh, the best thing to do is actually pick them up just before you're ready to plant them. However, if that's not the case, not convenient for you, you can pick them up ahead of time. But uh, do follow our instructions on hydrating these uh, root balls properly until they're ready to be planted. In addition to that, you may have to do some frost protection if you're planting before the end of May, which is when you should be planting. Uh, it's a double-edged sword there. You want to plant early, but you also have to do a little extra protection uh, from the possible frost. Uh, cedars are generally pretty good against frost. However, uh, we've had some uh, wild swings in our weather over the last couple years, and we have seen some damage done to cedars uh, because of uh, severe frost after warm periods. 
Now the actual hole that you're going to prepare for your tree should be about twice the volume of the actual root ball that you're going to be placing in there. Uh, again, this info video is on plastic pot or plastic rooted or root systems that are in plastic pots, but the, it's the same guidelines for bald and burlap. And uh, if you take a look to the right of the hole where the uh, tree is going to be sitting, uh, we have another hole, and we're, we call this the uh, big O inspection pipe. And what this is for is for you to see how much water or moisture is at the bottom of the root ball, at the same depth as the bottom of the root ball. So if you look, there's a dashed red line that goes across from the uh, hole for the plant, and it's at the same level as the bottom of the big O pipe, which is located a foot or two away from the uh, root ball itself. And uh, the idea is you do not see the bottom of the root ball normally, so you can't tell if it's sitting in water or if it's dry or what the conditions are down there. Uh, this big O inspection pipe located uh, near the root ball and it's going to be exposed also to the same conditions of that root ball will give you a very good idea what the moisture content is at the bottom of your root ball for your plant. Now there's no dirt put into the hole of the big O. You want it totally empty and clear because that red arrow pointing down to the bottom, that's going to be your hand. You will put your hand down the bottom of the big O pipe, touch the soil or the water to see what's going on down there, and then you'll have the information you need to determine whether or not it's time to water again because you never water your plants again until the water is completely drained. And in some cases you're going to wait 24 hours or possibly even longer before you water again. But you never water if, if there is water sitting at the bottom of that root ball. If the bottom of the root ball is sitting in water, that's more than enough. You now need to allow that water to drain completely. If you have very heavy clayish type soil, this may take a while. And we'll give you information specifically uh, with that later on in our info video uh, because if you've got heavy soil that drains very slowly you are going to be putting a lot less water into your hole than you would if you have normal drainage or sandy soil. Another point here is if you look at the sides of the holes around that root ball uh, it's kind of a squiggly line what we're trying to present there or is that the sides are rough. You do not want a smooth surface uh, around where your root ball is going to be because those roots as they grow out will hit the smooth surface bounce back in towards the center of the plant and end up choking themselves out again. So a rough surface even though it doesn't look as nice is actually much better for the plant long term than a smooth surface. Uh, this can become a problem when people use augers to make their holes because the auger makes a beautiful smooth surface. If you've got heavy clayish type soil what will happen is the roots will bounce off that smooth surface and come back towards the center of the plant and down the road will choke the tree out. So keep this in mind, especially with heavy soils. Do not try to make a beautiful smooth surface. Make it rough. The uh, roots will get into the crevices of that rough surface and that will force them to continue in that direction rather than bouncing off a smooth side. Another point here I want to mention, if you look at the top of that root ball, it is higher than the surrounding soil. This is generally our advice for most soil conditions. If by chance you've got sandy beach soil, uh, which occurs probably one or two percent of the time, very rare, uh, you could go flush with the top of your uh, root ball. But otherwise, always plant an inch or so above the surrounding soil. Now this shows an alternate, uh, an alternative location for the inspection pipe. In the previous uh, uh, slide, we showed that the inspection pipe was located outside of the hole where the root ball was. Here we have it inside of the hole, and this might be uh, the only option for you if you've got uh, a very tight area. So this is fine, but don't have it right up against the root ball. Keep at least eight inches away from the big O, or keep the big O pipe at least eight inches away from your root ball. As mentioned earlier, whenever you're planting, you should always fill your holes with water first. This does two things. It helps to saturate the surrounding soil, plus it gives you information as to how quickly uh, the water will drain in your particular type of soil. Uh, and a lot of times what you'll have to do is you, can ha you may have your plants home, you're ready to plant. However, you haven't tested your soil yet and you haven't put water into your holes yet. 
it's probably easier to water one day your holes or fill them up and then make plants actually plant the following morning early in the morning and the, most of the work is the actual holes being dug so if you've got that all done you can put a lot of plants in the ground in less than an hour as long as your holes are already dug and the wa ground's been watered already at least once you'll notice too that we uh, we flood the area with water and you don't just flood the hole for the tree you have to flood your test hole because you want to duplicate the conditions in your test hole that are going to be around your plant otherwise you're going to get get a false reading now natural rain obviously duplicates the conditions for both the test hole and the plant hole identically the same uh, but when you're watering manually you would have to directly fill your hole your test hole with water as well as the hole around the, the tree now the when you're watering the tree you're probably going to use about 20 times as much water as required to fill your test hole so keep that in mind just because your test hole filled with water in five or ten seconds your uh, tree itself is going to take probably 20 times that uh, in terms of volume and time simply because it's a bigger hole now this particular video when you put this much water in your system this is when you have average soil or sandy soil if you have slow draining soil you would not be using this method you would be using half the amount of water and we will identify for you later on whether or not you have slow draining soil or medium to fast draining soil the idea of the inspection pipe and I, we can't stress this enough is to allow a window into the water level down at the depth of the root ball bottom if there is water at the bottom of the inspection pipe then there is water at the bottom of the root ball and you do not need to water again you have to mimic the conditions at the big o, o inspection hole right the same as you would at the plant itself they have to be exposed the same way so uh, you need uh, say one gallon of water to fill your inspection hole you now have to multiply by 10 or 20 times as much to fill around the area around the root ball of the plant during the first year you should water heavy again shortly after the water has drained away at the bottom of the inspection pipe in most cases within 24 hours after is about the right time but the water has to be gone completely 100 percent gone you can't have water sitting in there if you have water sitting in there you are not to water again during the next year you can extend the timing between the watering uh, the amount of water will actually increase as the plant becomes larger it will need more water however you'll be increasing the, the time between the waterings uh, by even more so during the first year you might find yourself watering every two or three days heavy during the second year you might water every three or four days heavy but you'll be using 10 or 15 percent more water during that second year per application than during the first year because you have a larger tree now now preparing your hole for the planting you want to mix some bone meal at the bottom of the root system so this is the brown bar uh, that you see in our diagram here you would have at least one or two cups of bone meal depending on the size of your plant mixed in with the soil mixture and your root ball is going to be sitting directly on top of that that area there should be flat and loose you want that root ball to settle into that soil now if it's a plastic pot it's going to have a flat bottom so you would want to have a flat bottom in your hole and it'll sit directly on top of that don't forget you do have to loosen your roots up before you actually do the planting now I want to again stress again nothing goes into your big O pipe the big O pipe is left empty because where that blue arrow is right now that is going to be your hand going down to the bottom of that root ball or that big O pipe to see if there's moisture down there when the hole is half filled with the soil mixture and the bone meal that you've put in so far begin adding more water you want that soil to start settling down you don't want any air pockets in there continue adding bone meal and the soil mixture until you get to the top of that root ball and you can always add about an inch of uh, soil mixture on top of the root ball but not against the trunk of the tree you always keep dirt and mulch away from the trunk of the tree and you flood it the first time you want a lot of water no matter what the conditions are because you got to get that soil to settle down you're not even necessarily watering the root ball what you're doing is watering the soil you want that soil to settle down you can't have air pockets around your root ball again note the top of that root ball is sitting slightly higher than the ground around it 
and you can mound soil on top of that but not against the trunk of the tree. Here is a more finished diagram showing the, the brown line at the top would be your finished grade. Now you add dirt back into the hole a little bit at a time alternating between the bone meal and you're probably going to use about a cup of bone meal to every three to four gallon size pot. Uh, every pot we have has a standard industry standard size whether it's a one gallon or a 20 gallon size pot and you need about a cup of bone meal per three to four gallon of pot size. When the hole is, f when the hole is filled you want to water heavy again press down on the soil with your hands only, only to help eliminate the air pockets around there. Do not step on the root ball. You should only be using your hands to compress that soil, break up the soil. Uh, you can damage root balls by stepping on directly on the root ball. Uh, in this case, again, it's, this is plastic potted, but damage can easily happen to bald and burlap. So you never step on any type of plant, no matter what, on the root ball. Always use your hands and always off to the side of the root ball. There's no need to be pressing on the root ball itself. And uh, we always stress that you use 50% triple mix with 50% native soil. You don't want to use 100% triple mix with uh, any of your plants. It can be a little bit too rich. Uh, boxwoods seem to tend to take uh, pure triple mix uh, very well. But as a general rule, 50% triple mix, 50% native soil, plus your bone meal, and you won't have Now during the second year, this is the not the year you're planting it, the year afterwards, we will give you, depending on how much you've purchased, a, a supply of commercial grade fertilizer for free, no cost. This is the best stuff you can buy, it's what the professionals use and uh, it's got a special osmocote coating on it. Uh, it's released based on the temperature, precipitation, etc. It's a very good fertilizer, but you can't use it the first year. You don't use any fertilizers the first year. You use only bone meal, which is a root stimulant or calfloss, which is a also a root stimulant. Uh, you do not use any type of fertilizer from anybody during the first year because that pushes the plant and it's not established yet. You want those roots to be really well established before you're asking the plant to start growing quickly. So just let natural growth be what you're going to get the first year. Second year you come back, we give you free fertilizer in most cases and uh, that you would apply that ideally at the end of April, early May. April and May, there's some planting precautions uh, that uh, we are recommending now. Uh, the weather has been fluctuating more wildly than what we've been accustomed to in the past. We've had some really warm Aprils and some really cold Aprils. So uh, as an extra precaution, what we're recommending that people do uh, until the end of May is be on alert for possible frost damage, which is always a possibility. Uh, we do like to plant uh, in later April. That's a great time to plant. The, before the roots start to push out, especially on the cedars. But if uh, you're doing that, uh, be on alert for possible frost stress. Now, frost uh, stress is the worst you can get. It's worse than having ice on your plants. Ice actually will not bother your plants. It will actually protect your plants. But frost, because of the shape of the, uh, uh, the molecules in, in the frost itself, what you end up getting is these jagged little edges that literally will damage the surface of your plants. So you want to protect your plants from frost and you can get frost almost till the end of May. So uh, we definitely don't encourage you to plant any perennials until the latter part of May. But with a lot of the evergreens, uh, trees, we de uh, it is good to plant them in late April or early May, uh, but be a little bit on the alert for frost. Uh, the best way to protect against that is to uh, either throw a bed sheet over top of the plant if it's going to be below 7 degrees uh, Celsius that night uh, or and it has to be a calm night. A couple things have to be present for frost. One is below 7 degrees Celsius also uh, very little wind. In other words a calm night and then no clouds. If you got all three of those things you're going to have frost that night guaranteed and severity of frost can vary quite a bit depending on those conditions. 
but if it's raining you don't you're not going to have frost if there's a lot of cloud cover you won't have frost if it's so windy there's no frost if it's about seven degrees there's no frost so but you uh, you're going to get uh, several days between the end of April to the end of May where there is definitely a good chance of frost and you want to protect against that no matter what again quick way to doing it for a smaller area would be just throw a bed sheet a blanket whatever you want over top of the plants in the evening and they can actually stay on all day it's not a not a problem for the plant uh, it might get blown off you got to put it back on uh, if you're uh, if it's a little bit of windy in the evening but the conditions look like you might get frost because things will calm down later and your bed sheets getting blown off what you can do is spray water on top of the bed sheet that will give it some weight so it doesn't blow off and if it's cold enough it will actually freeze up a little bit which is even better because less likely that it's going to blow off with uh, that stiffness in it so uh, you can do that to uh, protect your plant against cedars or uh, against frost. Uh, another quick way to do it too is you can spray water on your plant uh, in late in the evening just before you go to bed and that will add another level of protection on your uh, evergreens uh, especially. You won't have to worry about this in most cases uh, with deciduous plants, just your evergreens and in particular uh, with the cedars you might get a little bit of frost damage on them. So you can spray them, you spray them with water just before you go to bed. Uh, you don't even have to put anything on top of that. That water alone will do quite a bit to protect them. Uh, but if you did a combination of spraying water and then a bed sheet on top, and spray water again, you know, you're not gonna have any problems at all. You don't wanna use uh, solid plastics on your evergreens for a couple reasons. One is they'll blow off real easy. All it takes one little gust of uh, wind and it'll be blown off uh, in no time. So something solid like a sheet of plastic it generally does not work very well uh, to to stay on all night and in addition if you forget and leave the plastic on the next day you can create problems with it overheating underneath it so a bed sheet is not a problem you can forget about it you can leave it on there the next day it's not going to harm your plant uh, you know you don't want to leave it on permanently but for a couple of days you can leave a bed sheet on a evergreen it's not going to bother the plant at all Here's a side sketch of, say, a backyard with a slope to it. Uh, the green down line is your backyard. At the very bottom, you'll see there's a blue line. And this is where the water is going to end up accumulating. Again, if you were to plant upslope uh, on that line, that green line, and you dig a hole down, uh, the water would now accumulate inside that hole. Um, even though it's not the lowest point in the backyard, uh, relatively it is the lowest point because you've got the soft soil that allows the water to drain down to the bottom of that soil until it hits the hard soil at the at the bottom of your hole. One way to get around that if you're planting up a slope is uh, if you want to imagine this you're up in the air looking down on your backyard uh, the hole is uh, the blue hole there uh, with the word hole in the center is what you've prepared for your new plant and uh, just above that is a half moon and the idea, idea of that half moon is to prepare a, a dam or a diversion for the water that's running down the slope of your backyard which is the blue arrows uh, those blue arrows when they get to that dam will now bounce off it to the side run past the hole so rather than running down into the hole they're running past the hole and this way the hole doesn't f overfill with water uh, keeping the root system too wet for too long. Make note if you have any downspouts that are coming uh, towards the new plants that you're putting in uh, because if uh, you do have a downspout you have to keep in mind that the uh, water from that roof area is all going to come down into a very small concentrated area and that area is going to be a lot wetter than what you uh, would expect uh, especially compared to the rest of the yard which will be much drier. So uh, as despite people believing that cedars want to be wet all the time, they, they really don't want to be wet all the time. They want to be lightly moist all the time, but not uh, sitting in water. Uh, it's just like a human being. If they sat or, or were below water for too long a period of time, they would suffocate. And so would the roots of cedars or any other plants. Uh, there are very few plants that can actually sit in water for any period of time. Uh, some hydrangea varieties can tolerate uh, water for long periods of time, but generally speaking, most plants cannot. So you, if you see areas like this in your backyard, that is an area where water is accumulating for one reason or another. It might be a low point, there might be a downspout from uh, your house, your neighbor's house, uh, runoff from a driveway, a patio, etc. Uh, but that's a red flag right there. 
Uh, here's a beautiful patio, uh, probably about 100 feet across from the grass up towards the house. And uh, keep in mind that uh, there's probably a downward slope on that patio towards the grass. And what's going to happen when it rains, if you get a half an inch of rain, which is a, that's a pretty good rain, uh, all that water that's falling down on the patio is going to accumulate as it runs down the slope and then just drop off the edge. So at the very edge of these of this patio, you're not going to get half an inch of rain. You're going to get two feet of rain, literally, coming down in that one small area. So that area is going to get very wet. And if it, there isn't good drainage, if it's not real sandy soil, and most people don't have real sandy soil, that water is going to sit there for quite a while. And if you've got really heavy clay, it could end up being wet permanently. So uh, again, test holes are very important uh, to keep an eye on what's going on with drainage. Uh, but uh, this is a red flag uh, easily seen uh, on a basic site inspection. And uh, keep, em, keep this in mind when you're looking around your backyard, patios, driveways, etc. They are all going to have runoff and they multiply the amount of water that uh, is present along the edge there where you may be placing plants. Now salting is very common on sidewalks and driveways, etc. Uh, obviously the, the benefit is that it uh, eliminates the ice, makes it a safer walking surface. However, plants do not like salt. There is no plant that likes salt. Some plants will tolerate it better than others. Uh, we encourage you to use absolutely no salt around any of the plants regardless. Uh, however, if there's a situation where uh, there may be a minimal amount of salt that you just can't uh, prevent because of a, a road or a sidewalk, etc., uh, your best to use black cedars. They can tolerate salt. Again, they don't like it, but they can tolerate some salt and you'll have better results with them because the salt will kill most plants. So don't waste your money on the plants or the time of planting them. If you plan on using salt, don't even put them in there. So Don't plant uh, your cedars near any large trees. Uh, keep in mind the canopy on that's above the ground there, the, the leaves, uh, down below, that's about how far the roots will spread out. And uh, at the very edges, it's, it's quite thin, but uh, they will still suck up a lot of water right to the edge of that canopy. So anything planted underneath that canopy is going to be in competition with a much, much larger tree that's going to have a lot more success. Uh, a typical large tree will suck up 100 to 200 gallons of water a day, believe it or not. And uh, any cedar that's in that area is going to have a hard time getting its water or the nutrition that it needs to, uh, to do well. Not to mention it's probably in the shade also if it's underneath that canopy. Now how would you describe the wind in your area? Uh, keep this in mind and bring that, to, uh, bring that information with you when you come down uh, because it will affect on what variety of cedars we may recommend to you or to give you some strategies on how to prevent wind damage. Generally speaking, if it's a very congested subdivision, you're going to have protection one way or another. But even within subdivisions, uh, with a lot of houses and trees around already, uh, what you could get is some very concentrated wind tunnels between the homes. Uh, the homes nowadays might be as close as six or eight feet apart from each other, and you're going to have all that wind being diverted around the edge of the house and down that wind tunnel. So you can have some pretty strong winds uh, even in, say, a, a protected subdivision area. A wooden fence along where your cedars are going to be is uh, usually a good idea. Uh, it uh, reduces the, the wind through the, the plant itself uh, as well as providing a little bit of shade to, to the ground. Uh, so during the hot summer months, it does keep the ground a little bit cooler. Now be sure to watch our other info videos on watering and fertilizing. After poor roots, improper watering is the cause of most plant failures. If you need any assistance, please call immediately, especially at the first sign of a cedar fading in color. Cedars seldom recover, but if you, you, but if you pick it early enough, you may be able to save the rest of your cedars by adjusting the watering, which is generally the problem you're going to have. Uh, again, if you go into our other info videos, you'll, you'll start to understand uh, where and why roots are the main cause of failures for cedars. And with our particular cedars, that's not an issue because we properly cultivate the root systems. So if there's a problem with one of our cedars, it's going to the root cause 99 out of 100 times is going to be improper watering. Generally, not enough water. Once in a while, too much water. So you have to understand what the proper watering 
amount and the frequency is in order to avoid any trouble. And at the first sign of a problem, we want you to contact us because we can get you back on track. Waiting until several start to fade on you is going to be too late because at that point, the rest are probably already stressed. Cedars do not tell you when they need water. They tell you when they're dead. Once you start to fade out like that, the chance of recovery is extremely slim. Now, we're more than happy to uh, share our info uh, files with you. Uh, they're available on the on YouTube, etc., at our website. In addition, you can come in with your own USB uh, transfer stick, and we will transfer uh, the whole library over onto your transfer stick, uh, no charge, of course, and uh, you'll have a probably a little higher quality and maybe a little bit easier to view than being on YouTube. So feel free to bring your um, your stick in. Uh, if we're delivering to you. Uh, we'll bring a, a USB stick with us and you can borrow that while we're unloading. You can load it onto your computer. We're always very happy to share whatever information we can give you.